glad that you're here. It looks kind of rainy outside, so it's good and safe in here. Uh, some of us need some more rain, so we'll, we'll pray for that. Um, the list has not really changed since this morning. Just to remind you to keep uh, Ed's father, of course, Kim. Honestly, Kim's just doing really good. I know she appreciates the visits. She's in room 216. Uh, Christine Caldwell. Christine's about like she has been, but the dementia and stuff, I think they think is, um, you know, well, I don't know what to say about that, but anyway, she does have hospice now. Uh, Tom's mother, Miss Bonnie, uh, had the, the leg surgery. She'll be in rehab. Uh, Nancy Sharp, uh, I, I know she'd appreciate just checking on her. Carrie Reed, Jamie Pendergrass is still at St. Thomas in Nashville. Paul Mays having some difficulties. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this last night or not, last week or not. I thought I did. Uh, Tom Brady that does our, our taping. He fell here a few weeks ago and broke several ribs. And, uh, and now he's got a problem in this arm where it's going numb. It, it's, it's sort of, and they're trying to get all that figured out. But if, I, I meant to mention him particularly next week. And uh, or last week, and I don't know if I did or not, but I know Tom would really appreciate uh, anybody making a call or, or a visit or a card with him. Remember, uh, the funeral for Madge will be uh, Tuesday, visitation from 9 to 11 uh, a.m., and then the uh, funeral at Vanderwalls will be Tuesday uh, at 11. Uh, gospel meeting going on right now at New Harmony. Austin Wiggins is the speaker. Some of us are going for the singing this afternoon and stay for the 4.30 service if you'd like to go. Stevens Gap meeting starts today and Bethel's meeting also uh, with Kyle Butt. Uh, that, uh, this next service will be tonight at 8 o'clock and tomorrow night at 8. Uh, Clint is leading our singing. Uh, John Young has her opening prayer. Pat still taking care of the Lord's Supper, and Alvin has our dismissal prayer. Go ahead and mark your hymn books to number 886. That will be the invitation song. We'll be singing the first and the third verse. 886. We're going to begin tonight with number 497. Five hundred and forty eight.
Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for giving us this opportunity that we have to be able to assemble here, just to be able to take this time to study another portion of your word, to be able to sing these songs of praise to your name, to be able to approach your throne in prayer. We ask you to be with each and every person that's been mentioned on the sick list. We are so thankful for those who have come through all their various illnesses and trials of life. And we just ask that you would continue to be with all those who uh, continue to face these different struggles and trials. Please be with all of them, all the doctors who are taking care of them, all their friends and family members, and all of those who give them support. Help us uh, as your church just to be supportive of them and just to be able to assist them in which, whatever way that we can. We would ask that we would all be attentive to the lesson as it is about to be presented. Just help us to take all the lessons that are contained within and help us to apply these things to our lives so that we can be strong examples in the world, that we can lead others to you. Just help us to always be doing this and to do your will, to spread your word to all those round about us. Just uh, help us, give us strength and guidance to do this. We would ask that you would please continue to watch over and guide this congregation. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Good to see all of you back again. Uh, we are going to be uh, covering today a series that we started a little while ago, and a series is coming to an end, uh, looking at the seven things that God hates. Uh, this is number five, so we got two more weeks uh, of going through this. Uh, you know, when we talk about being a Christian, talk about being a follower of God, we want to do the things that God would have us do and love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. And so that's kind of been the whole idea uh, of this series uh, when you look at the proverb, uh, Proverbs 16, we see a list of things that God hates. Uh, and these are the things that are presented. Uh, six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, what we're going to talk about today, uh, feet that make haste to run to evil, false witnesses who breathe out lies and one who sows discord, uh, among brothers. And so uh, we're going to talk today about that fifth uh, thing that God hates, uh, being feet that make haste to run to evil, or feet that run to evil. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. It's, it's a little bit similar to the one that we talked about last time, a heart that devises wicked plans. Uh, but what is the actual problem here? Uh, what does what this actually mean to be, you know, feet that, that run to do evil? Um, I think there's a distinction that needs to be made in those that run to do evil or run to sin and those that stumble to sin. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Uh, while both are obviously sinful, it is a sin to sin and it is always sinful to uh, do things that are in opposition to God's will. And all sins have the same consequence, the same eternal consequence. Sin separates us from God. Sin removes us from His presence. And, and because of our sins, uh, we incur the wrath, the justice of God. However, all sins may be equal in the punishment that comes from them, but not all sins are the exact same. And there, I think, is a distinction between sins of intentional commission and sins of accidental commission. And there's a, a distinction here that I think is, is somewhat meaningful. The Proverbs 11, 27. You know, whoever seeks diligently, or whoever diligently seeks good, seeks favor. But evil comes to him who searches for it. You know, the... In everyday life, if you have somebody that accidentally sins against you versus someone who is actively seeking an opportunity to sin against you, I think those are handled a little bit differently. Uh, when we have somebody that, that you know, does something wrong and does something you know, damaging to you, 
that's on accident. I think there's a bit of a distinction. When I was a kid, uh, my dad had just gotten one of his, the first cell phones that uh, he had. It was one of those old Nokia brick uh, phones. Uh, and uh, he had set it right by the bathtub because he was giving my little sister a, a bath. And I went to go get it for him, and I knocked it in the tub and totally fried the, the phone. He was not too happy with me, you know, as you can imagine. He had just spent all this money buying this brand new cell phone, and he was all excited about it, and, and it's fried and broken, totally broken. That's one thing. You know, that was an accident. I, I did not mean to knock the phone in. I did not mean to cause all this damage and all this trouble. Whereas if you had somebody that, you know, intentionally, uh, you, you, you get something new and they intentionally take it and, and destroy it out of maliciousness, there's a bit of a distinction there, right? You know, you're going to be more gracious with the one that, that is accidentally causing the dis- damage, accidentally causing the problem, than the one who is deliberately causing the problem. And I think we often find ourselves in that situation in spiritual terms. There's a lot of people that that are trying to do what's right and trying to follow after God and trying to be faithful. And yet, despite their intentions of faithfulness, they still make mistakes and they still sin. And sin is sin. You know, that's not an excuse for the sinful actions that they make. But nevertheless, despite their good intentions they still come up short. And I think that's different than those who, although they may have even known God and may have even become Christians, have willfully abandoned all pretense of faithfulness and have pursued, actively pursued, those things that are sinful. That's a different situation. Both sins are sin, but both sins are, I think, uh, different in their circumstance. God is a God who's very patient, and I am thankful for that. Uh, You know, God is a God who understands that humans are fallible, that we make mistakes, even despite our best intentions. I think about what Paul says. You know, he says, there's a a way that's right, and I know what I should do, and I want to do that, and yet my flesh drives me to do the things that are wrong. And I wish that I could just control myself completely and just stick to doing what's right, but you know, I, I just, there's this battle within me, and I'm, I often find myself doing the things that I don't want to do. That's the situation I think a lot of Christians find themselves in. There's this battle between you know, our, our fleshly desire to do things that are contrary to God's will and our you know, intellectual desire to do what's right and to be faithful. And I'm thankful that God is a patient God. Uh, one of the passages that should really give you comfort uh, when you read through the Bible, I think, is 1 John chapter 1. Uh, look at what John says here. He says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin." And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so here you have this kind of dichotomy. There's two paths you can cross. There's a path of light, which is difficult. It's narrow, you know, perhaps pulling from what Jesus says in, in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a narrow way, it's a hard way, but it's the way of light that leads to life and forgiveness. And there's a way of darkness. That's a much easier path to travel down, but it's a path that leads to destruction. It's a path where there is no hope, no life. The distinction between one who walks in the light and one who walks in in darkness is verse 9. You know, those who confess your sins, because God will forgive those sins that are confessed. It's a repentant attitude. It's a, a confessing, a confessive attitude. It's when I make mistakes, I learn from those mistakes, and I try to get uh, to to do better next time. I try to to be righteous. I don't give in to the temptation of just living a wild life apart from God. I'm walking in the light as God would have me walk in the light. 
And sometimes I stumble. And when I do, you have assurance that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from sin. And that word cleanse is very significant. It's, it's in a tense that is, you know, uh, continual. Uh, this is something that continuously happens. It's not a one and done occasion. This is something that occurs over and over and over again. And so we are blessed in that God is very gracious and his, his uh, forgiveness is continuous despite uh, the stumblings that we have when we walk in the light. Uh, I, I've told the story before, but I, I think a good ex- illustration of this is um, when I was a kid, uh, th- we had a big snowstorm, and my dad, six foot nine or six foot six, walks out to the uh, to the uh, car, and he's got big footsteps. And my little sister is trying to walk in his footsteps, and she's jumping and jumping and jumping. And sometimes she makes it, sometimes she doesn't quite make it. And then you know, I'm out there doing donuts in the snow, off just a totally different path. I think that's a good illustration. You know, there's a, you can try to walk in the steps of Jesus, and you walk the path that he walks. You walk in the light. Are you going to make it perfectly? No. There's going to be times where you fall short. But that's a different path than the one who just goes off on his own and, and lives however he wishes to live. Uh, that's a different thing. And so, feet that run to evil are feet that are not restraining themselves, but are feet that are embracing the sin. Uh, And I think there's a lot to be said about those that have uh, foregone all sorts of restraint and have open armed embraced uh, sinfulness. This is an issue that I think Paul addresses uh, in the book of Romans uh, the Romans say, uh, well, you know, God's grace is a good thing. It's a good thing for God to show grace. So let's just give God a couple occasions to show some grace, right? You know, if it's good that God forgives us, well, let's just give God ample opportunity to forgive us and let's continue sinning. And Paul's response is, what shall we say then? Shall, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. You know, are you kidding? Of course not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? You can't. Obviously you can't. And yet, this is the attitude a lot of people have. You know, God's just going to forgive me, so does it really even matter if I, you know, pursue righteousness? God's going to forgive me. Does it even really matter if I, you know, put in the hard work and self-denial that it takes to to do what, uh, you know, to live faithfully? Does it really even matter? matter? God's going to forgive. Paul says, yeah, it matters. You can't continue to live in sin. You've been cleansed. You've been, had your sins washed away. Stop living in sin. You can't go back to it. One more passage, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 27. This is a, a frightening passage. Um, the Hebrew author says, if we go on sinning deliberately, Uh, Or deliberately is important there. If we go on sitting deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But look at what does remain. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. What what the Hebrew writer here says is, is, listen, if you're a Christian and you continue to sin deliberately. This is not sin, you know, stumbling in faith. This is not you know, walking in the light and you, you don't quite match up to the footsteps of Jesus. This is you know, deliberate sin. There doesn't remain a sacrifice for you anymore. You, there, those are sins that will not be forgiven. You have, you have spit in the eye of God and you have taken His grace for granted and that, that grace that He is offering is, is revoked. It no longer remains for you. No. I think that's a significant and, and quite frightening passage. Because perhaps there's a lot of people who have begun to sin deliberately after their, uh, after their uh, baptism, after their sins have been removed. Uh, we need to be careful uh, to stay in a, in a heart, have to continue to have a heart that, that confesses our sins. 
and to be repentant of our sins. Uh, If we do that, uh, we can have assurance that our sins are washed away and washed away continuously. And we are forgiven. So uh, this next slide is is messed up, but but what it's supposed to say is, uh, how how do we fight this? Uh, Well, I think a good couple passages to look at uh, can be found in James. Uh, This is James 1, 6 through 8. Sorry, I got messed up last night on on my PowerPoint a little bit. Uh, But James 1, 6 through 8 uh, here says, uh, talking about uh, uh, the man who's got doubting and those sorts of things, he says, Let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's tossed, driven and tossed by the wind. For the person must not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What I want you to pay attention to, this passage is that idea of a double-minded man, or your translation may say a double-souled man, is somebody who's two-faced. You claim to have faith in God, but your, your actions and your faith, or your, your claims, are not matching up. You know, you claim to have faith in God, but you've got all sorts of doubts, and, and you're driven and to and fro by the waves. You know, you're here, you're there, you're all over the place. Don't be like that. And James uses the same idea back in James 4, 6 through 8, uh, and he says, uh, he gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded men. And so here what James is saying is, listen, if you want to combat this this propensity that people have to, to run toward sin, what you need to do is learn to take a stand against the devil. What you need to do is learn to, to not be double-minded. Don't be driven to and fro and don't be you know, driven by any wind that you hear. Rather, be steadfast and stand against the devil. That's literally what it says. It says, take a stand against uh, the devil. Uh, that's the word resist there. Um, kind of interestingly, the word antihistamine comes from that word, which is kind of funny. Uh, but, uh, you know, take a stand against the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, and so I think we come to, the, c- c- come to a conclusion that there's a lot of Christians that are just too passive when temptations come their way. They're not willing to do the hard work and stand for what's right. And when temptations come, it's so much easier just to give in and just go with the flow. And because of that, Satan wins the day. And Satan wins that battle, and, and the next one, and the next one, and eventually, you know, their spiritual condition is so mangled, it's, it's, it's unrecognizable. So the first step to living a, a life that's, you know, free from running towards the embrace of sin is to, to be able to grow to the point that you can take a stand. You know, don't give in at the first little wave of temptation that comes your way. Be strong, be anchored, know what's right, know what's wrong. I think another thing that we need to do is is follow the Spirit rather than the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, uh, Paul says, uh, I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And so, again, I think Paul has this idea that he talks about in Romans, or very similarly, of, you know, there's the things that I know to do, and I want to do those, and there's the things I know I shouldn't do, and I also kind of want to do those. And so there's these two little aspects that are at war with each other in my own own body, and I'm torn apart. You know, I'm doing the things I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, that's what I'm not doing. We as Christians need to side with the Spirit rather than the flesh. Side with what's good, and side with what's spiritual, side with what's godly, rather than giving in to the, the whims of the flesh. But I think there's a lot of people that really struggle with the materialism of life, so much so that they have neglected their spirituality. 
You know, we're so concerned with the things that we can see and touch and interact with and that are, you know, interesting and fun and appealing on earth that the things that are truly significant and lasting, those are totally neglected. We spend so much more time thinking about money and so much more time thinking about, uh, you know, goods and, and toys than we do about things of eternal consequence. And as a result, you know, there's a lot of Christians that are in pretty sorry spiritual conditions, for they care more about the world than they do about God. That's a problem. I think uh, another thing that uh, will, will help us to, to resist uh, running to evil is to learn to meditate on God's Word. We brought this passage up quite a bit. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. It's a really good chapter, though, and, and uh, in it, uh, it's broken down into, I think, 22 different sections. Uh, you, you may not know this about the psalm, but it's, a, uh, it's an acrostic, uh, meaning that you're, it's broken down into all these different sections that correspond with different letters of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, and uh, in that, uh, each one of these verses begins with uh, the, a letter, uh, the same letter. You can't quite see it in English, obviously, but in Hebrew you can. This is the mim section of uh, Psalm 119, the m section of Psalm 119. So in Hebrew, every single one of these verses starts with a letter M, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but look at what David has to say here. He says, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it's ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way. Does that sound familiar? Uh, in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, and for you have taught me. Uh, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Uh, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Now, this idea of, listen, there's all sorts of paths I can travel down in life, but there's one path that's the path of righteousness. And through learning and spending time and dwelling with the Word of God, I know what that path is, and I'm going to stay on it. You know, there's all sorts of different uh, philosophies of the age. All sorts of people have a lot of different answers to, to what it means to live a good life and all sorts of advice you can get. And, you know, if you're getting your life direction from Google, you probably made a mistake. You know, what you need to do is spend time with God's Word and make His laws your, uh, love His laws. Make His statutes and His guidance uh, a part of your life. Get, let them be the things that give you direction. And if you do that, if you keep his word, your feet are not going to be running to evil. Uh, verse 110, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. Amen. And often, you know, this is just a, a perception issue. When we begin, spend time with God's word, our perspective shifts and we realize what's important and what's not important. And, you know, I remember being a little kid and thinking about, uh, you know, hearing some, some sermons and lessons about heaven and talking about that and thinking, well, you know, it kind of sounds a little bit boring, right? You know, if, if heaven is just one big church service, then, you know, doesn't that ever get old? You know, that's, that's a really long time. But the perspective wasn't there. You know, this, this is not just about, uh, you know, self-entertainment. This is about being in the presence of God. This is about doing what's, what's right and uh, enjoying the, the goodness of God's mercy. And so, you know, often when people first begin to, or, or have never really studied the Bible, they, they read it and they say, well, that's, that is a big book to read, right? There's a lot to it. And, and it sounds boring. You, you get to Leviticus and you got all sorts of hard things to read. That's a perspective problem. But the more time you spend with God's word, the more you grow to appreciate it. And the more you grow to appreciate it, the more you grow to look forward to it. And your, your understanding shifts and it becomes sweeter than honey in your mouth. You know, the word of God becomes better than the best things that this life has to hold because you understand the significance of what it communicates. 
And so that's, that's our number three. So the way we fight against it, learn to resist the devil, uh, follow the spirit rather than the flesh, meditate on God's word. And finally, let's not discount prayer. Uh, when Jesus is there and he gives the, the model prayer to his disciples, uh, in verse 13 he says, uh, as a part of this prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, give us guidance to, to, to avoid what's wrong and to do what's right. Help us as, as we are, are into going through times of great trial and temptation when life is hard and against us. Deliver us from that and help us to do what's right. Now, let's not discount the, the power of prayer. Now, God hears prayers and he answers prayers. Being a prayerful person changes your perspective, a lot like uh, meditating on God's word. It, it orients us towards God and God's will. God answers prayer in, in providential ways. Let's be a prayerful people. When Paul talks about uh, the, the roles of the church, he says, You're, you need to be people that pray without ceasing. Be people that pray continuously. When times are good, pray. When times are hard, you need to pray. And so be a people, a prayerful people. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of Christians that have really struggled with this uh, in keeping their feet from running to evil. It requires breaking a lot of old habits. When you become one of God's people, you can't live the way you lived before. There has to be a transformation, a, a, an appeal to God's will rather than your own, a, a self-sacrifice, self-submission, and, and a recognition of the authority of God. That's a hard thing to learn. But as Christians, that's what we sign up to do. If we want to be a disciple of Christ, a follower of God, we need to love the things He loves and hate the things He hates. And he hates feet that run to evil, people that run to do things that are in direct opposition to his very nature. So let's stay where God is uh, and stay righteous and practice holiness and practice righteousness. Um, take a stance against the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, this afternoon, if you need to put Christ on in baptism, let me encourage you to do so. Maybe you're a Christian, but you've not been what you need to be, and you have not stood against sin like you ought to have. Uh, let me encourage you to make that right with God today. If we can do anything for you, come forward as we stand and sing.
bow together. For kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the blessings you give us. Thank for Heavenly Father for this beautiful day that you give us that we come together. Worship you in spirit and truth, study from your holy and divine word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Bible that we have to study and guidance to go by. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the avenue of prayer that we have the opportunity to come. Thank you for your blessing. Ask for, for help when we need it. For the comfort that we get from just talking with you. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the church here at Dayton. We pray as you continue the blessing, help us to continue to grow. As you now this time to go with us after we depart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.